in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was on the surface of the deep. The Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life is the light of man. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness could not overcome it. Through him, we have all received one gracious blessing after another. For the law came through Moses, but God's unfailing love and faithfulness came through Jesus Christ. Now, God made human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Then he blessed them and he said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. The man and the woman, they were both naked, but they felt no shame. Now, the serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had created. And one day he came to the woman and he said, Is God really saying you must not eat of any of the fruit of the trees of the garden? The woman replied, Of course we can eat the fruit from the trees of the garden. It's only the fruit from the tree of the middle of the garden that we cannot eat. For God says, You must not eat it or even touch it. And if you do, you will die. And for God knows that if you eat it, you will be like God. Your eyes will be opened, and you will know both good and evil. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful, and its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it could give her. So she took the fruit, and she ate it. And she gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were open, and they felt shame at the naked. So they gathered fig leaves together to cover themselves. And then they heard the Lord God walking about in the cool evening breezes in the garden. So they hid behind the bushes. And the Lord called out to Adam and said, Where are you? Adam said, I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. The Lord said, Who told you that you were naked? Did you eat from the fruit of the tree that I commanded you not to eat? said, it was the woman you gave me. She gave it to me, and so I ate it. And the Lord said to the woman, what have you done? She said, it was the serpent. He deceived me, and that's why I ate it. So then the Lord turned to the serpent, and he said, I will cause hostility between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. You will strike his head, and he will strike your heel. Now, Jesus was led into the wilderness where... He was tempted by the devil for 40 days. He ate nothing at all during that time, and he became very hungry. Then the devil came to him and said, If you really are the Son of God, tell this stone to become a loaf of bread. But Jesus said, No. The scriptures say people do not live by bread alone. Then the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. He said, All these kingdoms are mine to give, and I have been given authority over them. I will give them to you if you will worship me. But Jesus said, the scriptures say, worship the Lord and serve him only. Now, when the devil had finished tempting Jesus, he left until the next opportunity came. Jesus, now filled with the Holy Spirit's power, returned to Galilee. He was teaching regularly in the synagogues in the region, and news reports about him spread quickly. He was praised by everyone. There was a wedding celebration in the village of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the celebration. During the festivities, the wine ran out. So Jesus' mother came to Jesus and said to him, There is no more wine. Jesus said, Dear woman, that is not our problem, for my time has not yet come. But she turned to the servants and said, Do whatever he tells you. Standing nearby were six stone water jars used for Jewish ceremonial washing. So Jesus told the servants, go and fill the jars with water. So they went and filled them with water. And when they came back, he said, now go and dip some out and take it to the master of ceremonies. They did as he told them. 
And when the master of ceremonies tasted the water that had now become wine, not knowing where it had come from, but of course the servants knew, he called the bridegroom over. A host usually saves the best wine for last, or the, a host usually serves the best wine first, but you have served the best wine now. Now this miraculous sign at Cana in Galilee was the first time that Jesus revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. A man, there was a man named Lazarus. He was a Jewish religious leader and Pharisee. He came to Jesus late one night and he said, I can see that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. Jesus said to him, I tell you the truth. Unless you are born again, you cannot receive the kingdom of God. Nicodemus exclaimed, how can this be? How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Jesus replied, Unless you are born of water and of the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. For humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. For the wind blows wherever it pleases, and just as you can hear the wind, but you can't tell where it comes from or where it is going, so you can't explain how people are born again of the Spirit. What does, how can this be? Nicodemus asked. Jesus said, you are a respected Jewish teacher, and yet you don't believe my testimony? We tell you what we have seen and what we know, and if you don't understand me when I tell you about earthly things, how can you possibly understand me when I tell you about heavenly things? For no one has ever gone to heaven and returned, but the Son of Man has come down from heaven. And just as Moses lifted up a bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son, that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. For God didn't send his son into the world to judge the world, but to save the world through him. Now Jesus left Judea, and he returned to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually, he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well. In the Soon, a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and he said to her, Please, give me a drink. Now, she was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. And she said to him, uh, Sir, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus said to her, If you knew who you were speaking to and the gift God has for you, you would ask me for a drink, and I would give you living water. But sir, the woman replied, This well is very deep, and you don't have a rope or a bucket. Where are you going to get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoy? Jesus said to her, If you drink this water, you will soon become thirsty again. But anyone who drinks the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, welling up to eternal life. She said, well then, give me some of this water, and then I'll never be thirsty, and I won't have to come here to draw water. He said, go and get your husband. I, I don't have a husband, the woman said. You're right when you say you don't have a husband. You've had five husbands, and the man you're living with now is also not your husband. You've certainly spoken the truth. Sir, she said, I can see that you are a prophet. I have heard the Messiah is coming, the one they call the Christ, and when he comes, he will explain everything to us. He said to her, I am the Messiah. A time is coming, indeed it is here now, when true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For God is looking for those who will worship him in that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. When the woman heard this, she left her jar by the well and she went running back to her village, telling everyone, come and meet a man who knows everything I ever did. Could he surely be the Messiah? And the villagers, they came streaming back from the village to see Jesus. And when they saw the woman, they said, now we believe what you have told us, not just because we've heard it from you, but because we've heard it from him ourselves. Now we truly believe that he is the savior of the world. Now, in the desert, 
near Mount Sinai, an angel appeared to Moses in the flame of a burning bush. Moses was amazed at the sight, so he came to take a closer look. And he heard the voice of the Lord call out to him, I am the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yahweh is my eternal name, a name to be remembered throughout all generations. I have certainly seen the oppression of my people, Israel, in Egypt. Yes, I am aware of their sufferings. So I have come down to lead my people out of Egypt into a fertile and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh to lead my people out of Egypt. Moses protested. He said, but if I go, they will ask me, what is his name? What should I tell them? And the Lord said to Moses, I am who I am. Tell the people that I am is sending me to you. So God sent back the same man that the people had previously rejected to be their ruler and savior. And by means of many miraculous signs and wonders, he led the people out of Egypt. Now, in the desert, the people grumbled against Moses and Aaron. If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt, they complained. There we sat around pots of meat and ate as much food as we wanted. But you have brought this entire assembly out into this desert to starve to death. So the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of my people in Egypt. So at twilight they will eat bread, and in the morning they will be filled with meat, and then they will know that I am the Lord. And actually, in the at twilight they will eat meat, and in the morning they will be filled with bread, and then they will know that I am the Lord. So that night, quail came and covered the camp, and in the morning a layer of dew was around the camp, and when the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost appeared on the desert floor, and the people said to each other, "What is it?" Moses said, it is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. So the people ate manna for 40 years while they journeyed through the desert until they reached the border of Canaan. Jesus crossed over the far side of the Sea of Galilee, also known as the Sea of Tiberias. And when he arrived on the other side, he and his disciples sat down. Soon they saw a large crowd gathered to see Jesus. And so Jesus turned to Philip and he said, where do you think we're going to get bread to feed all these people? Philip said, even if we worked for months, we would not have enough money to feed all these people. Now, Jesus was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. And then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up and he said, well, there is a boy here with five barley loaves and two fishes, but what good is that with all these people? So Jesus said, tell everyone to sit down. And they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered about 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves. He gave thanks to God, and he distributed them among the people. And then he did the same with the fish. They all ate as much as they wanted. When everyone was full, he told the disciples, now go and collect the leftovers, for we don't want anything to be wasted. They picked up the pieces and filled 12 baskets full of the scraps left over from the five barley loaves. When the people saw this miraculous sign, they said, surely this is the prophet we have been expecting. And when Jesus saw that they were ready to force him to become their king, he slipped away to the hills by himself. Now, that evening, the disciples went down to the shore to meet Jesus there, but when they realized he wasn't coming back, they got into boats and went across the shore by themselves. Soon, a gale swept up, and the seas grew very rough. They had rowed for three or four miles, when suddenly, they saw Jesus walking on the water towards the boat. They were terrified. But Jesus called out to them and said, Don't be afraid. I am here. And they were eager to let him on the boat. And when he got on the boat, they immediately arrived at their destination. Now, the next morning, the crowd that had stayed on the far shore got into boats and headed across the lake to look for Jesus. And when they found him on the other side, they said, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. You only want to be, be with me because I fed you, not because you understand the miraculous sign. They said, well, we want to do God's works too. Tell us what to do. He said, the only work God wants from you is this. Believe in the one he sent 
They said, well, show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. What can you do? After all, Moses fed our ancestors in the desert. Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat. What can you do? He said, I tell you the truth. Moses did not feed you. My father did. And now my father sends you the true bread from heaven. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. I am the bread of life. Anyone who comes to me will never be hungry. Anyone who believes in me will never be thirsty again. I tell you the truth. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life within you. But anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise that person up at the last day. Now, when some of the disciples heard this, they said, this is very hard to understand. How can anyone accept it? And at that time, many of the disciples turned away and deserted him. But then Jesus turned to the twelve and asked, what about you? Are you also going to leave me? And then Simon Peter spoke up and said, Lord, to whom would we go? For we believe that and know that you have the words that lead to eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus traveled around Galilee. He wanted to stay out of Judea where the Jewish religious leaders were plotting his death. But soon it was time for the Jewish festival of tabernacles. And on the last day, the climax of the festival, Jesus stood up and shouted to the crowd, anyone who is thirsty may come. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare rivers of living water will flow from his heart. Now, when Jesus was speaking of living water, he was speaking of the Spirit that would be poured out on all who believed in him. But the Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. Now, Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning, he was back again teaching at the temple. And a crowd came to listen to him, so he sat down to teach them. And as he was teaching them, the Pharisees and teachers of religious law brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. This woman was caught in the act of adultery, they said. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? Now, they were trying to trap Jesus into saying something they could use against him. But Jesus just stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer. So eventually he stood up and said, all right, but let the one of you who is without sin throw the first stone. And then he stooped down and continued writing in the dust. Now when the accusers heard this, they slipped away from the crowd one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. He stood up and turned to the woman and said, where are your accusers now? Has not one of them condemned you? She said, no, Lord. Then neither do I, said Jesus. Now go and sin no more. Then Jesus continued teaching the crowd, and he said, I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will not have to walk in darkness anymore, for he will have the light that leads to life. Now, as Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Lord, was this man born blind because of his own sins or because of his parents' sins? Jesus said, it was neither because of his sins or his parents' sins. This happened so that the power of God could be shown in him. So Jesus, he spit into the dust. He made mud with the saliva, and then he wiped the mud on the blind man's eyes. And then he told the man, now go and wash in the pool of Siloam. Siloam meaning scent. So the man went and washed and came back seeing. Now, when the man's neighbors and others who knew him as a blind beggar saw him, they said, is this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some said, yes, but others said, no, it just looks like him. The man kept insisting, I am the same man. Now, some of the people brought him to the Pharisees because it was on the Sabbath that Jesus had made the mud and healed him. The Pharisees refused to believe that the man had been blind and could now see. So they said to him, God should get the glory for this, for we know this man, Jesus, is a sinner. The man said, I don't know whether he's a sinner, but I know this. I was blind, and now I can see. 
heaven. Well, tell us what he did. How did he heal you? The Pharisee said. I told you once, didn't you listen? Why do you want to hear it again? The man said. Do you want to be his disciples too? But then they cursed him and said, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. For we know God spoke to Moses, but we don't even know where this man Jesus comes from. That's very strange, the man said. You don't know where he comes from, yet he healed my eyes. Ever since the beginning of the world, no one has been able to open the eyes of someone born blind. If this man were not from God, he couldn't have done it. You were born a total sinner, the Pharisee said to him. Do you, are you trying to teach us? And then they threw him out of the synagogue. Now, when Jesus heard what had happened to the man, he came and found him. And he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? The man said, who is he, Lord? I want to believe in him. And Jesus said to him, you are speaking to him now. Indeed, you have seen him. And the man said, yes, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped Jesus. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep, and they know me just as my father knows me, and I know the father. I will sacrifice my life for the sheep. I have other sheep, too, that are not in this sheepfold. I will go and get them and bring them to me, and my sheep will hear my voice. Then there will be one flock with one shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Surely, your goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Then the Lord said to Elijah, Go and live in the village of Zarephath, near the city of Sidon. I have instructed a widow there to feed you. Sometime later, the widow's son became sick. He grew worse and worse, and finally he died. The widow cried out to Elijah and said, Oh man of God, what have you done? Have you come here to point out my sins and to kill my son? Elijah said, Give me your son. So he took the boy's body, carried him upstairs to the room where he was staying, and laid the child's body on his bed. And then he cried out to God and said, Oh Lord my God, why have you brought tragedy to the home of this widow who opened her home to me, causing her son to die? And then Elijah stretched his body out over the boys three times and cried out to God again and said, Lord, let this child's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's prayer. The life of the child returned, and he revived. Elijah brought the boy back downstairs to his mother and said, Look, your child is alive. And the woman said, Now I believe that you truly are a man of God, and I know that God truly speaks through you. The Lord took a hold of me, and I, Ezekiel, was caught up in the spirit and taken to a valley filled with bones. He led me everywhere throughout the valley. The bones were completely scattered everywhere and completely dried out. And the Lord said to me, Man of God, can these bones become living people again? I said, Oh, sovereign Lord, you alone know the answer to that. And then the Lord said, Speak a prophetic message to these bones, son of man. Say, dry bones, listen to the word of the Lord. Look, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I will put breath in you, and you will come to life. I will put flesh and muscle on you and skin to cover you. I will put breath into you, and you will live again. And then you will know that I am the Lord your God. So I did just as he commanded me, and as I spoke, a rattling noise filled the entire valley. And then as I watched, the bones came together to form complete skeletons. And then flesh and muscle formed to cover the bones. And then as I watched, skin formed to cover the bodies. But they still had no life in them. And then the Lord said to me, Speak a prophetic message to the wind, son of man. Speak a prophetic message and say, 
Come, O oh breath from the four winds, breathe life into these dead bodies that they may live again. So I spoke just as he commanded me, and life came into the bodies. They came to life. They stood up a great army. A man named Lazarus was sick. He lived in the town of Bethany with his two sisters named Mary and Martha. And so Mary and Martha sent word to Jesus that Lazarus was sick, and the message said, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. Now when Jesus received the message, he said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. No, this has happened so that the Son of God can bring glory to God and that God will be glorified through this. So even though Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. Now when Jesus arrived at Bethany, he had got word that Lazarus had already been in his grave for four days. When Martha heard that Jesus was on his way, she ran out to meet him and she said, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus said to her, Lazarus will rise again. She said, yes, Lord, I know he will rise on the last day when everyone else rises. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live again, even after dying. Anyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. Do you believe this, Martha? Martha said, yes, Lord, I have always believed that you were the Messiah, the Son of God the one sent into the world from God. Now when they arrived at the tomb, Jesus said, roll the stone away. But Martha, the dead man's sister, protested, saying, Lord, he's already been in his grave for four days. The smell will be terrible. Jesus said to her, Martha, didn't I tell you that you would see the glory of God if you just believed? So they rolled the stone away. And Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Thank you, Father, for hearing me. You always hear me. But now I say these things out loud for the benefit of all these people standing here, that they will believe that you have sent me. And then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out! And the dead man came out, his hands and his feet still wrapped in grave clothes, his face bound in a headcloth. And Jesus said to them, Unwrap him and let him go. Six days before the Passover celebration, Jesus arrived again at Bethany, at the home of Lazarus, the man he had raised from the dead. Uh, Martha was there and she served, and Lazarus was among those who ate with Jesus because a feast was put on in Jesus' honor. Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from the essence of nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet with it. And then she used her hair to wipe and the fragrance filled the room. Now, when the villagers heard that Jesus was there, they all came running to see him and to see Lazarus, the man he had raised from the dead. But now the Pharisees wanted to kill Lazarus too, for it was because of him that many of the people deserted them and believed in Jesus. Look at my servant, whom I strengthen. He is my chosen one who pleases me. I have put my spirit upon him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or raise his voice in public. He will not crush the weakest reed or put out a flickering candle. He will bring justice to all who have been wronged. He will not falter or lose heart until justice prevails throughout the earth. Even distant lands across the sea will wait for his instructions. God, the Lord, created the heavens and stretched them out. He created the earth and everything in it. He gives life to everyone, breath to everyone who walks on the earth. And it is he who says, I, the Lord, have called you to demonstrate my righteousness. I will take you by the hand and guard you, and I will give you to my people Israel as a symbol of my covenant with them. You will be a light to guide the nations. You will open the eyes of the blind, releasing those who sit in dark dungeons, setting the captives free from prison. Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his time on earth had come to an end and that it was time for him to return to the Father. 
he knew that all authority in heaven and on earth had been given to him, and that he knew that he came from God and that he would return to God. It was supper time, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. So Jesus stood up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. Then he washed his disciples' feet, using the towel he had wrapped around him to dry them. And when he came to Simon Peter, Peter said, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? <coughs> Jesus said to him, you don't understand what I'm doing now, but someday you will. But he protested and he said, No, Lord, you will never, ever wash my feet. But Jesus said to him, If I don't wash you, you won't belong to me. When Jesus had finished, he put his robe back on, sat down at the table, and he asked his disciples, Do you understand what I have done? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, because that's what I am. But since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. I have given you my example to follow. Now go and do as I have done. And now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house, there is more than enough room. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And when it is finished, I will come and get you, and then you will be with me always where I am. And you know the way to where I am going. No, Lord, said Thomas, we have no idea where you are going, so how can we know the way to get there? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You would really know me. You would know who my Father is, but from now on, you do know him, and you have seen but then Philip said, Lord, just show us the Father, and then we will believe. Then we'll be satisfied. The Lord said, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am? Don't you believe that I'm in the Father, and the Father is in me? If you have seen the Father, you have seen, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. For the words I speak are not my own, but my Father who does his work through me lives in me. So just believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe because of the works you have seen me do. I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works, for I am going to be with the Father. Ask me for anything in my name and I will do it so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, and the branches that do bear fruit he prunes so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by my message. Now remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch that is severed from the vine cannot bear any fruit, and in the same way you can't be fruitful unless you remain in I have told you all these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. This is my commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. After saying these things, Jesus crossed the Kidron Valley with his disciples and entered a grove of olive trees. Judas, the betrayer, knew this place well because Jesus had gone there many times with his disciples. The Pharisees and temple guards had given Jesus, or had given Judas, a contingent of temple guards and Roman soldiers to accompany him. So now, with blazing torches, lanterns, and weapons, they arrived at the olive grove. Jesus fully realized all that was going to happen, so he stepped forward to meet them. Who are you looking for? he said. Jesus, the Nazarene, they replied. Now Judas, the betrayer, was standing there with them. And when Jesus said, I am he, they all drew back and fell to the ground. Jesus said once more, who are you looking for? Jesus, the Nazarene, they said. Jesus said, I already told you that I am he. So since I am the one you are looking for, let these others go. 
So the Roman soldiers, their commanding officer, and the temple guards arrested Jesus and tied him up. Then Pilate had Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip. The soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they threw a purple robe on him. All hail, King of the Jews, they mocked as they slapped him across the face. Then Pilate handed them over to be crucified. They took Jesus away. He carried the cross by himself and came to the place called the Place of the Skull in Hebrew, Golgotha. When he arrived there, they nailed him to the cross. Two others were crucified with him, one on either side with Jesus in the middle. And then Pilate posted a sign on the cross that read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. The soldiers divided his clothes among the four of them. Standing near the cross was Jesus' mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus saw his mother standing next to the disciple he loved, he said to her, Dear woman, here is your son. And then he said to this disciple, And here is your mother. And from that day on, this disciple took her into his home. Now Jesus knew that his mission on earth was now complete. So to fulfill scripture, he said, I am thirsty. And sitting on the ground was a jar of sour wine, so they dipped a sponge in it, put it on a piece of branch, and put it up to his lips. And when he tasted the wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head, and he gave up his spirit. Who has believed our message? He was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be, be made whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. We have left God's paths to follow our own, and yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and harshly treated, and yet he never opened his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and like a sheep is silent before it shears, he did not open his mouth. No one cared that he died without descendants or that his life was cut short in midstream. But he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He was put in a rich man's grave and buried like a criminal. Early on Sunday morning, Mary Magdalene arrived at the tomb but found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She stood there crying, and as she wept, she knelt down to look inside. And there she saw two white-robed angels sitting at the head and the foot of the place where Jesus' body would have been lying. And they said to her, Dear woman, why are you crying? She said, They have taken my Lord, and I don't know where they have put him. And as she turned to leave, she saw someone standing there. Now, it was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. And he said to her, Dear woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. So she said, Sir, just tell me where you have taken him, and then I will go and find him. He said to her, Mary. She turned and said, Rabbi, which in Hebrew means teacher. Then he said, Don't cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to be with my father. But go and find the brothers. Tell them that I have gone to be with my father and their father, with my God and their God. So she went and found the disciples, and said, I have seen the Lord, and she gave them his message. Now, that Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there in their midst, and he said, Peace be with you. And as he spoke, he showed the wounds in his hands and in his side. And they all rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Then he said once more, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And then he breathed on them. And he said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone their sins, they will be forgiven. But if you don't forgive their sins, they won't be forgiven. And then he came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. 
Surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. During the 40 days after Jesus suffered and died, he appeared from his disciples, he appeared to his disciples from time to time and proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. And he taught them about the kingdom of God. One time when he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until my father sends you the gift which he promised that I told you about before. For John baptized with water, but in just a little while, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, to Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, when he finished saying these things, he was taken up into a cloud while they were watching and could no longer see him. And as they stood there straining to see him rise into heaven, Suddenly, two white-robed men stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? For Jesus has been taken from you. But one day, he will return to you in the same way you saw him go. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, the sound of a mighty, roaring windstorm filled the house where they were sitting. And then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. Then, there were devout Jews from all areas living in Jerusalem at this time. And when they heard the loud noise, they came running to hear what this was all about. And bewildered, they said to one another, these men are all from Galilee, and yet we can hear them speaking in our own native languages. We all hear them speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. They stood there amazed and perplexed. How can this be? What does it mean, they said to one another. Some from the crowd said, oh, they're just drunk, that's all. But then Peter and the other 11 apostles stepped forward and shouted to the crowd, listen, all of you. Fellow residents of Jerusalem and fellow Jews, these men are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is far too early for that. No, what you have seen here today was predicted by the prophet Joel long ago. In the last days, says the Lord, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. I will pour out my spirit even upon my servants, male and female alike, and they will prophesy. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now everyone who believed Peter's message that day were baptized and added to the church, about 3,000 in all. In Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius who was a Roman army officer and a captain of the Italian regiment. He was a devout and God-fearing man, as was everyone in his household. He prayed regularly to God and gave generously to the poor. One afternoon, about three o'clock, an angel appeared to him in a vision, standing there. Cornelius, the angel said. Cornelius was terrified, so he just stood there and said, What is it, sir? And the angel said, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have been received by God as an offering. Now send some men to Joppa to summon a man named Simon Peter. He is staying at the house of Simon, a tanner who lives near the seashore. So when the angel was gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier, one of his personal attendants. He told them what had happened, and he sent them off to Joppa. Now the next day, as his men were nearing the town, Peter went up on a flat roof to pray. And the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, Three men have come looking for you. Get up, go downstairs, and go with them without hesitation. Don't worry, for I am sending you. So he got up, and he went down to meet them and said, I am the man you are looking for, but why are you here? They said, We have been sent from Cornelius. He is a devout and God-fearing man, well-respected by all of the Jews. A holy angel summoned him to your, or instructed him to summon you to his house so that he can hear your message. Now, Peter then invited them to stay the night. The next morning, he and some of the other brothers from Joppa went with them, and then the next day they arrived in Caesarea. 
Cornelius was waiting for them. He had gathered his friends and close relatives to hear their message. And Peter said, you know that it is against our customs for a Jewish man like me to enter a Gentile home like this or even to associate me with you. But now God has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. Now, even as Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening. The Jews were amazed to see that the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles too. For they saw them speaking in other tongues and praising God. And then Peter said, Can any of us object to them being baptized now that they have received the gift of the Holy Spirit just as we did? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Paul and Silas traveled around the areas of Phrygia and Galatia, and they had to stay out in the province of Asia because the Holy Spirit had prevented them from going there at that time. Paul had a vision. A man from Macedonia in northern Greece was standing there pleading with him, come to Macedonia and help us. So they left at once, having concluded that the Holy Spirit was calling them to preach the good news there. Then they arrived in Philippi, which was a district, which was a city in the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. They stayed there several days. Now, on the Sabbath, they decided to go a little ways outside the city to a riverbank where they thought some people would be meeting for prayer. They met a group of women there, and so they sat down with them. One of them was Lydia of Thyatira, a merchant of expensive purple cloth who worshipped God. As Paul spoke to her, the Holy Spirit opened her heart and she accepted what Paul was saying. She and her entire household were baptized and she invited them to be her guests. She said, if you agree that I'm a true believer in the Lord, then come and stay at my home. And she urged them until they agreed. Sometime later, they went back to the place of prayer and they met a slave girl who had a spirit that enabled her to tell the future. She earned a lot of money for her masters by telling fortunes. She kept following them around day after day, saying, These men are servants of the Most High God, and they come to tell you how to be saved. And this went on day after day, until Paul became so exasperated that one day he turned to the demon within her and said, I command you in the name of Jesus to come out. And instantly it left her. Now her master's hopes of wealth were now shattered, so, they, so he grabbed Paul and Silas and dragged them before the city officials at the marketplace. The whole city is in an uproar because of these Jews, they said to the city officials. They are teaching customs that are illegal for us Romans to practice. So a mob quickly formed around Paul and Silas, and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods. They were severely beaten and then thrown into prison. Now the jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape, so he put them in the inner dungeon and clamped their feet into the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God as all the other prisoners were listening. Suddenly, a massive earthquake shook the prison to its foundations, and the prison doors flung open and the chains of every prisoner fell off. The jailer awoke to see the prison doors wide open, and he assumed all the prisoners had left, so he drew his sword to kill himself. But Paul shouted, Stop! Don't kill yourself! We are all here! The jailer called for lights, ran to the inner dungeon and fell at their feet. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? He said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved along with everyone in your household. And then he shared the word of the Lord with him. He and his entire household were baptized, and he brought them into his house. He set a meal before them, and even at that hour of the night, he cared for them and washed their wounds. Everyone in his household rejoiced because they all believed in God. After Paul and Silas left prison, they returned to the home of Lydia, and there they encouraged the believers once more. Then they left town. This letter is to Paul and Timothy, is from Paul and Timothy, slaves of Jesus Christ. I am writing to all of God's holy people in Philippi who belong to Jesus Christ, including the church leaders and deacons. May the grace of God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. Every time I pray, I make my requests for all of you with joy. 
for you have been my partners in spreading the good news from the first time you heard it until now. Is there any, oh, and I am certain that God, who began a good work within you, will continue his work on the, until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together with the believers? Any fellowship together in the Spirit? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with one another, loving one another, and working together with one mind and one purpose. For you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Don't be selfish. Don't think of others as better than yourselves. Be humble. Honoring others is better than yourself. Don't think only of your own interests, but think of the interests of others too. For you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he didn't, did not consider equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges, humbling himself as a servant, being born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to Christ and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God has raised him to the place of highest honor and given him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for all things were created through him, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or rulers or powers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, and he is the firstborn from among the dead, so that in all things he might have supremacy. The Lord will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves, and then we, together with them, will be caught up in the air to meet the Lord in the clouds, and then we will be with the Lord forever. I, John, saw heaven open, and standing there was a white horse. Its rider is called Faithful and True, for he judges fairly and wages a righteous war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one understood but he himself. His robe is dipped in blood, and his title is the Word of God. All of heaven's armies, dressed in the finest of white robed linens, followed him on white horses. He had a sharp sword coming from his mouth with, with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will release the fierce wrath of the Lord God the Almighty like juice flowing from a wine press. And on his robe, at his thigh, is written this title, The King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And then I saw the new Jerusalem, the holy city, coming down out of heaven from God. And she was beautifully dressed, prepared as a wife and a bride dressed for her husband. Then the one sitting on the throne called out to me and said, Look, God's dwelling place is now among his people, and he will dwell with them. He will be their God, and they will be and he will wipe every tear from their eyes. No longer will there be any more death or mourning or crying or pain, for God himself will be their God. The old order of things has passed away. Then I heard the voice of the one sitting on the throne say, look, I am making all things new. And then he said to me, write this down, for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And then he said to me, it is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. All who are thirsty may come to me and drink freely from the springs of the water of life. 
And then he showed me one of the angels containing, holding the seven bowls containing the seven last plagues. And he said to me, come and I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. So he took me in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, descending out of heaven like from God. It sparkled like a precious gemstone, like jasper clear as crystal. And then he showed me the river of the water of life, flowing down from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. And on either side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, each yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse, for the throne of God and of the Lamb are in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. No longer will there be any night. There won't be the need of a lamp to guide them, or the sun to guide them, for the Lord God himself will give them light. And his servants will serve him forever. They will reign forever. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Let the one who hears say, Come. Let the one who is thirsty, Come. And let anyone who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. The one who testifies to all these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. May the grace of Jesus be with all God's people. Amen. Amen.